Welcome to Radio Free Sunroot. You're listening to the interview podcast, Voices for Nature and Peace, where we discuss issues of ecology, empire, justice, and consciousness. We feature a variety of guests who are aware of the challenges of our time and who are working to address them. Here's your host, Calibri Ter Sonnenblum. The mythical, the political, and the sublime, featuring Phil Rockstro. Phil Rockstro is a poet, lyricist, and philosopher bard living in Munich, Germany. His mother escaped Nazi Germany after the Gestapo arrested her father. His father was born on a Choctaw reservation and adopted to white parents, but did not learn about his origin until later in adult life. Phil grew up in Appalachia, lived in Manhattan, and eventually expatriated to Germany. I was inspired to ask Phil to be on the show by a recent essay he wrote, The Banality of Evil of the Evil of Two Lessers, and the Democratic Party's raison d'etre is to co-opt, absorb, marginalize, and neutralize the left. But when we started talking, we immediately branched out to other topics, including names, the legacy of our ancestors, how German youth helped spark the hippie movement, the drama, poetry, and gods of ancient Greece, Appalachian culture, the alienation of contemporary life, Phil's lifelong travels, and much, much more. Can you pronounce your name for me? I am terrible at pronunciations. <clears throat> yeah, sure. The, the first name is, is Colibri. So it's Colibri. The, yeah, it's, okay. it's, uh, it's for, it means hummingbird in Norwegian. Were you christened with this name or did you, you don it yourself like people did in the punk rock era that I'm from? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. I am. Um, yeah, no, my parents gave me a different name and then I legally changed my name. Yes. Yes, I think that's always an important aspect of rebirth. Yes, yes, absolutely. How could your parents possibly know who you are? <laughs> I know, right, right, yeah, and they, they, uh, yeah, and there's obviously such a long tradition in in literature and everywhere of you know names being changed to represent you know growth or whatever. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we are. A pro- I think we don't give enough um, homage to our ancestors like primitive cultures do. Um, but at the same time, we, we, you know, one of the aspects of that we can embrace from modernity is the ability to reinvent yourself and not define yourself strictly by a pathological culture. So, right. you know, that's one of those things is what can I get from the ancestors? Because I think we are haunted in our time because we don't. I, I think that's a large part of the agitation of the spirit we have is the dead trying to communicate to us. And, and in po- poets understand that you're always getting this this pull from the ancestors of what is ancestral memory and what is before me now. And do you think that that applies to uh, only to one's literal ancestors, blood ancestors, or is oh, it... I, th- I think it, all of it going right back to whatever is dreaming the cosmos now. Right. You know? And I think, but I think that our ancestors do have, they're going to be there. I mean, they're, you know, um, if you want to make this material reductionistic, I mean, they're in our DNA. Right. I mean, you, you know, you, you have aspects of you, you have trauma. I come a product of two Holocausts. My father was born on a re- res in the, um, um, the United States Midwest. My mother escaped Nazi Germany on a kinder transport. And so I definitely feel um, a, a heightened sensitivity, I believe, um, due, due to colonialism and imperialism and and the rise of fascism and its connection to capitalism because of that. Right. I mean, and not only because I grew up in a house where there it was common to see people with tattoos on on their arms, like well, my grandfather. But um, but because of that, I think even if I had been adopted, I still would have picked up those sensitivities. I'm convinced of that by um of, of how the um, so many so so many I'm haunted by so many things even before I knew about my father's ancestry in Alabama, um, the way how I felt um, when I was in in Choctaw territory, for example, finding arrowheads on the ground and um, the resonance that had even before I knew what what um, the history was. So I, I'm convinced that the, between the Native American aspect of um, 
my ancestry that there there is and particularly the, the, the you know the, the the complete denial in our culture about that aspect of of uh, the the odious history of um we were taught that that was progress wiping out um you know genocide it's right there in the declaration of independence that that jefferson is threatening the tribes of the west unless they adhere to his enlightened vision that they they face destruction yeah ab- absolutely i feel like to use the to use the the parlance that's come up recently you know i think that you know centering native americans is what has to happen in the united states at this point before we move forward or try to move forward in any area whatsoever you know of our of our domestic or or foreign policy that we have to come to terms we just can't do it we have to face that and i think that you know that's what i was saying i think that's why the ancestors come to us not not only to give tradition but to release us from what no longer works but if we ignore it um we 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 are taken by this aspect of the spirit that makes us you know modernity makes us manic to begin with you know we're told being well adjusted um to a consumer capitalist consult, um, culture is to have constant manic activity you know the greeks would have seen it as a madness of hermes the winged trickster god that that had a dual role one to lead the dead into the underworld and and the other to be a messenger god but if only one aspect of Hermes was recognized, that, then you, you would get these manias of the spirit. And so I think if you look at you know New York City, which I lived in for, for decades before, before, before expatriating to Europe, um, I, I, I constantly, you were seeing, her, excuse my language, but you were seeing Hermes bullshit. You were seeing constant salesmanship. You were seeing tricksterism and, and you were seeing that aspect of capitalism. And I, I think that, that, being spirit possessed as as opposed to um, pursuing soul making, I, I think is one of the reasons we see such pathology in American culture. Is what what is you know the, the soul of the America of America is obvious. You know, I wrote an essay one time, which was about what was verifiably great in American is what came through Afro Caribbean culture meeting Appalachian culture in a tribal drumbeat. You know, there you can find the soul of America. And also that was influenced by, by the fir- First Nations drumbeat also. So that mixture that came in there. But and, and that's and I think I was lucky enough to be born in a time where I could explore that where I was born in Appalachia and then drift down to the Mississippi Delta and live in New Orleans for a number of years and to be able to pick that up. You know, they would never you know, I live in Germany now. Um um, Papa could never become jazz. You know? <laughs> right. You needed New Orleans for that, and there is no, there is absolutely no understanding of what the eff- essence of New Orleans is in in Germanic culture. Yeah. You know, I've, I met many working class Britons that pick up immediately what what the the hopelessness is of the working class, and it's felt through it's felt through rock and roll and the blues, but. You, you you can come across Germans that sort of get it, but mm, they can't quite get there. Right. Yeah. My my own personal blood heritage is German and Norwegian, mm. with a little bit of a uh, French, you know, thrown in there. And so, um, uh-huh. I I don't feel uh, personally. I haven't I haven't felt I've never felt in uh, much connection to those cultures myself in my life, uh, except maybe for a propensity for uh, little fish and cans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, I, mean, the, 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 I mean, alienated German youth created hippie culture. Okay. They, ca- they came to Northern California and they very much influenced what was going on in Big Sur and the Beats and opened the first health food store in Southern California and Los Angeles. This is German. And so the... A- the German young people that came huh. to the United States and okay. as far back as the 19 as far back as the 1940s and influenced Kerouac and um, Northern California beat poets and, and, and those guys going way back that far. So the alienation from industrialization that you can go back to the paintings of Turner and others in the Romantic period, having the, the Germanic idea of you know how the German mind picked up so easily on um an industrialized world as a comp- compensation for the ancient gods like Votan, you know, where where you have this wandering trickster god that, 
you know, was able that the, the the dramatic culture was able to in, endure the onslaught that kept coming from Rome, but at the same time created that clash in the German culture between the romantic vision and a hyperlogical vision that still possesses a dramatic soul. Now, so many young people and other people were were influenced to return to nature. Of course, nature, as you know this, because of what I understand from reading your, your essays and um, and Facebook posts, is if you, you have returned in some way to um, those resonances that are so much lost because we hunger for it. But of course, you know, we, we always have to define ourselves as a human being in nature and not become possessed of nature, which is um, indifferent to our fate. And so our struggle with humanity has always been between having the, the, the divine consciousness that comes through the nature of gods and how that plays through the, the polis, it plays through the communal aspect of our being and, and how do we find a way to endure being both feral and civilized. I really like how you put that, how to endure being both. I feel like that uh, particular uh, struggle or examination or whatever it is really takes up, um, <clears throat> pardon me, a very large part of my own time and energy and reflection and then guides uh, the, the choices that I make. Yeah, and well, I mean, the, the, the choices we make were, you know, the, the Greeks, and I always return to the, to the Greeks for this because they had a civilization they had Athena, their god, which was the goddess of the polis of the city, and all of the, these other aspects where they were meeting other people, and yes, not perfectly enslaving some of them, and working out how do how do you add the goddesses that you're coming across, in, in, that, 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 that these matriarchal cultures, how do you add that to the culture instead of eliminating it? What marriages do you have? And, and the Greeks looked at this, this between the struggle bet between the Apollinean of the higher aspects of the self and the Dionysian, and hence theater was invented, Dionysus being the, the god of theater. And in there, you can have the protagonist, antagonist, choir, chorus effect, and these struggles, you know, um, you know, look what happens to Pent, you know, um, look, look what happens in these stories, like, um, for, for, for example, in the Arestia, where you have revenge cycles that go on or generations or the fate of Pentheus, who is handed his own head by by his mother and his own wife because he's gone too much over into, into patriarchal arrogance. So all we, within the Greek idea of constantly returning to the theatrical aspect where these things are worked out, like like voting in our culture, which is. Uh, ostensibly, which you called me to talk about, but I tend to get diverted. <laughs> our, our culture, you know, some people think it should be mandatory, but uh, um, theater attendance was mandatory in, in Greek culture. Oh, I had no idea. Yeah, the entire culture might be weeping over um, the fate of Agamemnon at any given time, hundreds of thousands of people visiting the theater a as they trudge back and forth from it. And now that's that's interesting, because that points to like, that they're being so there was like a, a national, a national entertainment culture that was happening. Yes, there, it, it really wasn't looking as entertainment. I would put, I would use James Hillman, the founder of archetypal psych, post Jungian psychology's term for it, of soul making. Okay, is you know it wasn't we we it wasn't like you know sometimes I get strung out on a YouTube series or or you know but we usually with music but on Netflix you know. I've got to see what happens next. And I'm up way too late. It was no, it, you, you might have 100,000 people weeping at once in this collective experience. And, you know, of course, uh, other smaller cultures had that within the rituals. I mean, one time a friend of mine and I were sitting in Central City Park on the uh, on the um, St. Joseph's Day parade. And in in the parade, the, the, the various um New Orleans Indian tribes put on their masks, they put on their feathers, they meet each other in the street, they have a kind of a ritual conflict that plays out completely in theater. And then at the end of the march, everybody marches into the park, and then a very crucial thing happens. The masks are removed and people look into each other's faces as human beings. And so these these are very ancient ways of keeping keeping 
peace among conflict that we have completely lost, as you can see in the United States now, that, that roving militia, you know, cameo clad men, products of the alienation of capitalism and their own internalized shame and their feelings of loss of control think they can be solved it by, by staring down the sights of a gun where you feel this control to have a I, growing up in the South. I understand a little bit about gun culture. I, you know, my father gave me my first gun when I was 10 and you get this feeling of control and power and the less feeling of control you have in your life. You want life to be as decisive as the feeling of squeezing the trigger and a decisive rifle shot cracks and a target is affected by it. And if when you feel powerless, clutching a gun, going for that is is what is the go is the go to mechanism. Um, it happened in, with the brown shirts here in the streets. And if you look at what's happening in the United States right now, very similar, terrifying scenario. Uh, I, the, I wonder about the comparisons between Germany and the United States and uh, not only how accurate they are, but but how but how accurate they would even need to be in order for people in the United States to be like, holy shit, what's going on here? Right. Well, well, I think what's happening here is our, our burning internally in the unconscious that, you know, I, as, I, as I noted earlier, my sensitivities for this, that my mother left Nazi Germany on her kinder transport her. My grandfather arrested by the Gestapo and taken to concentration camp. Um, my father being born on an Indian res and, and um, stolen from his birth mother, taken to an orphanage which specialized in selling original people, children to farm families. And my my both my wives um, are Southerners. Me growing up in the South, my my, uh, my first wife's um, her father and grandfather were Klan members. Um, my my wife's immediate family. My 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 wife was born in a um, in a tenant farmer shack in the South Carolina Low Country. Um, her family have Klan members in them too, and spending time with the um, broken to shards white working class where I grew up in a working class neighborhood. I, and also having a mother that, that came out of Nazi Germany. I, um, I can see the similarities. I mean, this is, this is all caused by um, a combination of what Engels talked about with bourgeois false consciousness and the effect it has on the proletariat of spending their life um, feeling less than, feeling shame, feeling somehow um, they have failed and you cannot handle that feeling of shame and failure. I was watching a, um, a Black Lives Matter parade going through, I believe it was a city of Salem in central Oregon, and the men and w women o obese, overweight from feeding themselves the palliatives of sugar and fat that, that American, the, the horrible American diet offers are screaming at him, losers, get a job. That is so obviously displaced pain. Right. And when because, the Germans felt, go ahead. No, just because what, what you're saying there is that they're describing this projection. They're describing themselves. Yeah. I mean, that this is what, you know, my father, um, he lost the ability to, to, to live a laboring class life when he fell from a, pig iron freight train um he was he was loading pig iron and he fell and and destroyed his back so um manual labor was out for him and so he taught himself photography during um the period of his convalescence and by the time the civil rights movement started in um started up in in the deep south and martin luther king chose birmingham a city built by northern industrialists to mine the ore from App from Appalachia, bring it into Birmingham and process it. And the, the northern, the Yankee ruling class in the city, we called them the big mules. They lived up on top of Red Mountain. The rest of us lived down in the industrial smog. My father would have to change his shirt coming in two or three times a day because of the grit on it. Um, Martin Luther King chose Birmingham because um, the methods of apartheid were very well applied there, a divide when my father would go and ask for a, for, for a raise, um, for example, they, the the, um, the the boss would say, "I can go out in the street and find 
five N words, and he he didn't make the name nicer, um, and and replace you right now for a fraction of what I pay you. So racial politics were used in any apartheid system to have a very hateful white um, laboring class in Birmingham, and Martin Luther King chose Birmingham for that reason. My father happened to be there with his with his camera. He had a, he had a small photography business, and he was able to become um, Life Magazine's um, Southeast Stringer at the time. So my some of my earliest memories are standing in the dark room looking at dogs attacking children and looking at the of the pictures of the era and also not seeing how my neighbors around me who felt so crushed by a system which they had no power in um, and their reactions to it and how they were controlled. Also coming from the, you know, the, um, coming from the, the German side of my family, the way it went the great depression, Hitler and the Nazis had 3% of the vote. Uh, um, uh, can you say hello to everybody? Okay. Hello, this is this is Phil's son. Hello, my name's August, and I'm seven years old. Okay. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> yes, the Nazis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's great. He heard some kids in the yard earlier. That's the reason why he wasn't on the beginning part. But ah, he heard right. some kids, and I'm not going to draw him away from kids in the yard to to do. You know. For, for a radio interview. So so anyway, but the Germans had maybe three, two, three percent of the vote before Wall Street called in the debts of um, that that came about due to the um, the Treaty of Versailles. And um, there you had the crushing experience that that caused ordinary bourgeois false consciousness to collapse in, into the catastrophe of the unconscious roaring through in these arc with these archetypal presences that, that, you know, that's the thing is alluding to what I was saying about the Greeks is there are ways that we realize that the gods still live in us. As Jung said, the gods have become diseases, but we have to mediate the part of the gods that are immortal and we're not, um, you know, that's what addiction is about. Uh, the, the Dionysus and other gods come through us. They get high. The person doesn't. The god could care less whether the addict lives or dies. It will go on to the next person in existing in this collective form that we have. So how do we differentiate? And I think this is crucial in politics is this is how we don't fall into a reflexive unconsciousness of, wh of whether – what we have we chosen the right side of this? Have I become dogmatic? Am I possessed by something archetypal? We have this dialogue that happens at, at, at theater, and it's best in in us in this kind of polytheism that the soul exists in, and this ongoing dialogue that seems to be able to mediate truth in a better way than our ego conscious is able to. That's fascinating, and I, it seems like what. Partly what we're talking about here are uh, layers and layers of trauma. Layers and layers of trauma, which it is to be born into this world. Right? We come into the world, we're nurtured at our mother's breast, we live in primal grace, we're in innocence, we're, we're, we're in Eden where the fruit, the fruit falls onto our laps. And, you know, maybe the Father God walks through us every once in a while, but he's distant and then what happens? We, we grow into consciousness. The serpent arrives. It gives us the fruit of knowledge of our humanness. We have a loss of innocence. You know, this is where the cliche, only the good die young. Yeah, you're going to die of yourself that lives in primal grace, and it's going to be a terrible shock. And what do we do with ourselves at that point when we, we – where are we once we, we come out of that? You know, if we stay in it, we are toxically innocent. We're in, it, we're in what James Hillman called toxic innocence. We're constantly projecting, you know, I mean, the, the toxic innocence in our culture causes everything from the homophobia of the right, where the inability to, to see the two spirit aspect um, that my father's people saw, saw, saw homosexuality and, um, and the whole and looking at life in a way that somebody might be a transvestite or might might a man might want to wear women's clothing or actually feel like a woman inside. We could, both left and right can't handle that. 
because we don't say, oh, there's a spirit that there, there's a God that exists that say that is the son of Aphrodite and Hermes that, that was called was called Hermaphroditus. <laughs> right. So there is that God right there. So within us, we have all these different divergent spirits. My father could not admit that he was set till he was 70 years old because he grew up in a in, in in a hyper masculine southern culture that he had bisexual tendencies and he said it drove him crazy all his life wow and at the and age of 70 he finally he said was something. 70 years old and said you know there's parts of me that's gay and he said and i said yeah i kind of figured that out when i was 14 and found your gay porn huh. <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah i mean that one is just such a such a struggle i've struggled with that uh, particular one and those kinds of feelings uh, my entire life and never found anywhere within American society where I feel truly, um, truly welcomed, actually. Yeah, when I was young, I was always drawn to, as, as you can probably notice through this dialogue, that I was drawn to theater. And so I met, and so my friends in high school were not, they couldn't come out, you know, it was, it was, it was the seventies mm -hmm. and, you know, they didn't come out till the 20th anniversary. <laughs> then you saw people show up. I didn't go to my high school reunions, but I could see on the Facebook pages and the, the internet stuff that was done at the, the people that we knew were gay finally came out and brought their partners. But, you know, I felt that affinity early on. I mean, I want to bet one time, with another guy that was a heterosexual, but I wasn't homophobic because I was because I, I knew I was around, you know, the theater that was that I was doing that I was drawn to other misfits. I was drawn to people who put on a mask. My best friend, he could do the Wizard of Oz, every voice in it from beginning to end. And I was in worship of his talent. And I knew deep down he was gay, but I didn't confront him with it because that was too embarrassing at the time. And so it, so there was. That that aspect of it, I'm I bet I, I want to bet a friend of mine. We took a uh, we took up a collection in the high school lunchroom about would we walk to the local store, which was about a half a block back and forth from the high school, holding hands. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> and so you know, not being homophobic, I took the bed and we walked back and forth, and we got about twenty. We, you know, we 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 wanted we we, we collected about twenty dollars each. Nice. <laughs> so, 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 but I, I figured out later. I said, "Why were so many of my friends in high school gay?" Well, it was the aspect of feeling like a misfit early on, mm -hmm. you know, feeling like being half Jewish uh, and um, ha half Jewish, half half cracker. Um, growing up working class, and when we moved to Atlanta. We moved into a neighborhood of, of small apartment complexes, which they call which the the rich, um, more wealthy Jewish kids around. Um, they called it the projects, and then there was a working class neighborhood around there, and it, we, the class divisions were all there, and it was extremely painful for me. And um, you know, I was drawn to more of the, of, of the cracker culture because of the music and the fast living. But there was a part of, I, I guess, my Jewish soul that did not want to completely engage in the self-destructive aspect of it because they were people whose lives were essentially going to be lived very quickly in high school. Very exciting stuff. The motor, the, you know, um, you know, the, the, the roar of souped up muscle cars, all of that Dionysian aspect that's wonderful about American culture was there. Of course, I was drawn to it. And then, then the other side of it, there was a caution about life that came from the very snobby Jewish kids that called my family white trash. And so there I was sort of caught in the middle middle of these two cultures. But it did give me it did give me a very strong class sensitivity. Um, you know, with my father who um his trauma in life caused him to join um the airborne at at, at seventeen years old because his mother had moved out of um she had moved away from um New York City, born in the Lower East Side, impoverished, had had the talent to be an opera singer, but not the social and societal connections. It ended up in New Orleans, met my um, my who I'm named after, Philip Perry Rockstow, a New Orleans um, gambler mm -hmm. who decided he wanted to be a gentleman farmer, moved to Missouri, a pr pr um, got a farm. That's where my father came from. They they couldn't have children. He was adopted from the, um, the orphanage I mentioned earlier. That's the Specialized in giving away children for farm labor, but my father was lucky enough for that. But when 
Philip Perry stroked out. They ended up in Birmingham, Alabama, where my 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 um, grandmother had ended up among her Jewish family. So what I was saying is I was torn between all these different worlds. And at first it was a curse of feeling alienated and not fitting in. But later you realize all these um, different characters existed within um, that gave a polarity to becoming a poet. And it gave, you know, it gave the impetus for that. All of which I know has nothing to do with what you called me about. Oh no, about that's American fine. Duopoly. <laughs> I, I, I'm happy with wherever the conversation goes. But but um, it's, so what I'm really what I'm what I'm hearing here that's really fascinating, um, and which I've I've thought and reflected on on before. But you put it put so well is that it feels like what you're talking about here is that there's this immense depth uh, to all of our lives, uh, and yet mm. at the same time uh, we are we seem to be living in. Um, consciously or whatever word you want to use in a very superficial place. Right. I, I think you put that very well. Um, there's a lot of resonance in what you say is that what we take to be on the surface and we're conditioned by this because there's a, a lot of existential pain comes out of, the, out of having these sensitivities. And I've read, I've read your, your writing on the subject. You, you seem to have somewhere along the line gained those sensitivities too. When you have these sensitivities, you're going to feel alienation, you know, which Marx and Engels and many others wrote about was the defining aspect of the modernist era is, is an immense alienation and even an alienation from self. And so Artie Lang, you know, called it the false self that we, this mask we put on so we can fit in and they're not, constantly being pummeled by, by rejection and our own alienation. And so this alienation from, from both the world itself and from the depth within us, um, you, know, you know, the native culture looks at it this way. You know, you go, th th there's many stories about going into a cave and that descent into darkness, sometimes with the aid of psychotropic plants, allows one to see that one's vision of the world is a, is not the whole picture. There, there, there is, and I, I, I would quibble with the term transcendence because we don't come above anything. We go down and we reach down into the loam of ourself, into into the soil of ourself, reaching all the way down to Persephone's throne in the underworld, and then we we go upward and our trees branch out. And those are the transcendence aspects that are maybe played like musical strings by by the winds of existence. But the essence of ourself is is the trunk, the branches, the fruit and the roots and everything the roots touch. The fungus down that's below connecting root system upon root system and also where we, what we have forgotten about and what we have buried where our roots are twined around the dead. And so all of the, uh, the, the, this connective principle that 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 we have lost and we go to the mall, we shop, we get online, we get addicted to that. We, 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 we f go manically from place to place, which, of course, there's a God in that, too. There is a winged God in that. But, but but we also have to keep returning. We the shaman would come when we were all being fat, happy and stupid. And it would be a time that then because the caribou had moved on, the buffalo had moved on and it was summer was ending like now. And the shaman would show up and bring, he would bring a bone and say, this is you. It's time to pack up the tents. It's time to move on. And we would nomadic would move on. And then when winter would come in the oncoming months, and the world would seem it was dying to us and the sun would be out for shorter and shorter times. The same shamanic figure would return with a sprig, a green sprig, which still remains in the Christmas tree and say, this is you. You are eternal. And having that tension that exists between the part of us that is the, eternally the green sprig, sprig of transcendence and the thing that dies is I think if we understood that, then I don't think we would have a problem in wrapping our, our hearts and minds around the tragedy of climate chaos that is that that is sweeping through the West in a wildfire as we speak and burning to ash our understanding of the world. 
And so what is I think what is lit, what becomes literalized is because we don't deal with them in, in ritual. You know, Jung put it famously that, that what, what, if you do not make the unconscious conscious, you will find it before you before you again and again is fate. And look at the trajectory of fate of Western civilization that, that keeps us on such a shallow surface level. This is why I'm always saying the crucial thing is poetry. The crucial thing is theater. The crucial thing is music. This is what the left of our time is missing. There has to be a component where you, you you have the politics and the music and the poetry and all of that dovetail, have a convergence, have have this gumbo constantly boiling that creates culture. Yes, I hear you. I definitely hear you. Yeah. Um, the the lack of, of ritual in our society is something I've thought a lot about and specifically about the lack of a rite of passage uh, that there's no one of them. Yes. I mean, that's definitely something that we miss that, you know, uh, one thinker and I can't remember who it is, put it in terms of uh, that a rite of passage was used to, t- to take the ego, which forms as a self-defense and to put the ego in its place as just one aspect of of living. But that in right. cultures like this, where we don't have that, the, the ego runs away with itself and, and, and comes to, to dominate. The, the person. And that's part of the reason that we live in these superficial and selfish places here is because we never had uh, this this ritualistic experience of of putting that ego into its place. Right, right. Existing is once asked. Yeah, you, I, the app term you used was runaway because we're I think the a good analogy is what Gregory Bateson called addiction. He compared it to a run, runaway train that has lost its governor switch. And so the train keeps hurtling, exponentially hurtling forward till it derails. And if you look at the exponential not- nature of climate change, you look at the exponential nature of addiction till the, till the attic hits bottom. And I think that's why addiction is a very defining metaphor of our time, that a tolerance sets in, you know, and you're and you need more and more and more. And the addiction is really to more because, as um, it's been put, you can never get enough of what you really don't need to make you happy. <laughs> so, so we const- we 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 have lost our governor switch. We are in runaway as a culture. And as you said, yes, you you have this initiation ritual because you initiate, you die of the childhood, and. You know, you, and so in America, you can see all these infantilized people waddling around, and they're very angry infants. That their their sense of thwarted entitlement becomes a very ugly thing when you're confronted with it. But also here in Germany, though, they crush the child's spirit too young, and I think you know that's the thing is all children are geniuses until they enter public school. <laughs> 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 I mean, really, really, and this has actually been studied as children think like a genius till six years old. And the defining aspect of it is, yes, that's when they go to school and they're so socialized in a pathological way. How do you keep open that that connective principle yet at the same time you move beyond the uh, infant, a constant infantilization where, yeah, and, and this, this is an interesting um, dichotomy here is infantile omnipotence. How is that, you know, that the, the Zen connection of oneness and infantile omnipotence are the same thing. It's just depend on, like you said, what is the ritual that mediates the two? It says I am a part of everything and everything is about is in me. But and the defining thing that happens in ritual is you realize this is a collective experience and I don't have total control over everything what they call in the big book of alcoholics anonymous self will run riot Mm. where do you meet that thing that thwarts you that blocks you but uh, but that causes you to deepen into the soul but also does not break your your winged spirit where sometimes you need to fly over the barrier or become a ghost and go through it and I think the missing component is a total failure of imagination because the Western consciousness through the age of enlightenment and material reductionism does not even recognize psyche. And there is the crucial notion is people that learn to live with the environment around them live in psyche. People that are alienated and don't even believe psyche exists 
are going to be constantly in a state of trying to return to psyche through literalized self-destruction. And we are doing that on a planetary basis as we speak. And it's happening exponentially. And what do you mean exactly by psyche? Psyche from the Greek word meaning soul, but which, which we have in psychiatry, mm -hmm. which psychoanalysis, it translates to the, the, the idea of soul psyche. Yeah, I don't know if you're are you familiar with the Greek story of Eros and psyche. A little bit. Mm -hmm. Psyche, the most beautiful mortal that was on the earth. So beautiful, in fact, people would tell her, you're as beautiful as Aphrodite. The goddess Aphrodite came and said, you must sacrifice th th this creature of hubris to me, or I will destroy the village you come from. Her family reluctantly brought her to be sacrificed. The, the sacrificial blade was raised in the air, but she rose in the air and rode as a zephyr across the skies because Aphrodite had sent her son Eros to to kill her, but instead he fell in love with her, carried her off to his mm. magical palace, which we see still in the story of Beauty and Beast, where everything happens, and then a betrayal happens. She goes through the tiles, go, go, Psyche goes to the underworld, and through twists in the story becomes the only mortal able to live on Olympus. So the word Psyche is the word for soul, Eros is the word for love, and by be and being in the world, we have our souls move through all these different places as Psyche did. But the, 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 the word Psyche, which we take to be consciousness itself, um, I would more likely say the definition is soul, but it is the way that our consciousness, both what we in modernity call the unconscious and the conscious exist together in this bubble known as self. And so we don't recognize, as you were saying, the totality of uh, of the, you know, we're going to uh, let me let me correct myself. We're never going to know the totality of it. We're not gods, but we're always living in a mystery where we realize we're living in a totality, a totality that we uh, can never understand, and that gives us humility. And what we were talking about is rituals. One of the things that comes out of what you were saying is the initiation ri ritual is the humility of being human in a larger order. And what what are the small things I can control? The vastness of all I can't control, I will do my part to control what I can and be of service in this life to my people. To And I think now we're moving into a time where we have to go, how can I be in service to greater humanity, which I think creative sorts have always known and people drawn to religiosity have always known in their in their better moments. Um, but how do we move to a time where we have rituals which which will take us and grip and grapple us and redefine us in a way that, that we're not so hubristic? We don't have the arrogance. We don't have the sense of entitlement to um, to believe we're gods because, um, you know, it's gods that, that, that both make us and destroy us. And I don't think human beings... Um, we were not at, let me put it this way, we're not at our best when we're possessed in that way. How do we hold on to our, our tattered humanity despite it all and be some service to something outside of ourselves? And I think ritual, as you pointed out, um, allows us to return and again and after, after we've forgotten, because we will. You know? mm -hmm. We will keep endlessly forgetting, so we endlessly need to be reminded of the interplay between the, who we mistake for ourselves and what we misapprehend is the world. Right. You know, it, I, I've, 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 you know, not using your words, but, but um, in my head, I've felt many of these different tensions uh, going back and forth my whole life. And also I have been pulled towards um, this urge to serve that, that you're talking about as well. And the place that that has taken me, over the last few years in the American West has been towards um, trying to, to live a life that is more in, in connection with the, with the non-human world, with, with nature. And of course those are problematic because we are nature and we're in it, but, but um, the, the parts that we consider are separate from ourselves here. And so that's been my attraction, for example, to the wild tending where people are attempting to uh, recreate 
uh, or return to uh, a life that's based on being out in the elements, interacting with the elements, uh, with humility, as you say. I think that it's not always, uh, that word isn't always used, but I feel like that's that's intrinsic to that. And of course, these uh, these wild tending ideas are all connected to uh, Native American life ways and to Native American um, ideals, some which are passed directly from those from, from, from Native Americans and some which are reinterpreted. Mm-hmm. And, well, I see your saintly work with kitty cats. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, well, there's a feral cat colony on this piece of property that my, my yeah. um, friend bought, so I, I take care of them, but... But yeah, but yeah, but I've been spending more and more time. If you want to gain humility, be around cats. Oh yeah, (laughs) definitely. Yeah, no, that, that, that definitely helps. Well, cats are, are a funny one because they came with, they came to us, uh, with civilization, you know? Yeah. Uh, and so when we were gathering and hunting, we didn't have that same relationship with cats. That happened when we started to store the grains, you know? Right. And once we were storing grains, we were attracting rodents and, and, you know, the rodents, the same rodents who lived in the field. And of course that attracted the predators who were in the, in the, in the field, you know, as well. But, you know, I, I guess that I, more and more, I, I, I feel this tension between, um, civilization by which I, I just literally mean, uh, city based culture, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and, and then the, the older, the older ways, which were the ways we lived for several hundred thousand years before the agricultural revolution. And so, uh, it's, 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 um, it's interesting then to bring in the Greeks and these other cultures because those were civilized cultures, but they were earlier ones than ours and seemed not so disconnected as, as ours is. Well, I think they had the same problems we did. We did is like how do you, you know, the, the Greek idea of, of the goddess Athena, which is if you read the, um, if if you look at the evolution of Athens, it's followed through with with Aeschylus and his Orestian tragedy, which starts off as as we know during the the Trojan War and the revenge cycle that happened, so Agamemnon could get that that the wind to to, to sail off to war. And then ends in a trial in Athens itself when his son, who, who after this terrible revenge cycle of happened to the murder of the father and the mother, and how do you end this re- revenge cycle where the Furies are taking their toll? He's, he's told by he's told by the Oracle to go and put yourself on trial in Athens. Go to and Athena becomes essentially his defense attorney. The Furies are the prosecutors, and and. So what 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 is what is what happens is he's spared. He is given he, he mercy is given, even though mercy is given to Aeschylus. But a deal is worked out. A deal is worked out between Athens, the symbol of the city and and the Furies, these older goddesses that are demanding revenge cycles. You know, they have razor sharp teeth. They are fearsome. Um, we, we would say, you know, we would mansplain that they're irrational, but it's not quite that simple. <laughs> right. And, but so a deal has worked out that, that, that the, um, the furies, that the furies become the guardians of the democratic process and the mortal enemies of their, those who bear false witness. And they're given a place in the city itself because the city's not going to go away. Mm-hmm. The city is now a reality of life until and Athens didn't fall it in, until a terrible they became insular. They squandered their fortune. They built a wall. They, um, they, they, they and with, with the silver that was found and um, that the, the, they were destroyed by essentially a flu virus that came through that nobody had immunity to. And they they, they lost to their mortal enemy, the Spartans, after that. We have a lot to learn from that. From that, also, but <laughs> yeah. the Greeks were the Greeks were working, the Greeks were working very hard at how do you where is it that we have all that we we have these civilizations that are still agrarian they are, and now they are part of the Greek Empire and of course being human beings that was not perfect they had slaves, women had a place in culture that we 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 definitely should reject. But the poetic aspect of their souls were working this way out because, in my opinion, what I alluded to earlier um, is 
they had a definite belief that human beings had a had a pantheon in them that we were polytheistic not monotheistic that there wasn't a distant judgmental sky daddy uh, out there that div- and so we divided the world into for, for, i think a good example of it is the greeks believed in the daemonic which the christians turned into a demonic presence the greek idea of the daemon was their idea of the demon was the intermediary between a human being and the gods because the guy a, a human being could not understand the gods much less look upon them without being destroyed so a human being had a connecting principle in a uh, that that spoke that where the gods spoke to him called called a daemon now this but the christian imagination the judeo christian imagination turned it into into a demon and we see it in in the form come out of the hysteria of fundamentalism where you know that it's somehow all connected to them generally with the sex drive um, and that, you know, th- th- they try to exercise the demons from everything um, rather than have an understanding of where their place is in the pantheon of the self. So what I say is that the, the, you have a lack of recognition about, of, of people that are, are materialism based, based. They have a reductionistic science that says all this is just superstition, there's nothing to learn from it. And the other side of, of fundamentalism, which is another form of concretism that doesn't understand the po- how the soul speaks in poetic metaphors and, is, and is, is moved by how instinct and poetry are the same thing. But there's a, there is, as I was made before with the allusion to the root, to, to going up to the flowering branch. It's the totality of the instinct that can express itself in music and express itself in theater. It can express itself in all the forms that we call art, as long as its roots are deep in the underworld. And that's where I think we've forgotten. So when I say that we are missing the aspect of psyche, what I mean by that is both the function that, that causes us to have an autothonic going down into the depths of ourselves and by way finding the, the greater cosmos both within and outside of ourselves. And of course, you know, to use Martin Buber's idea of you, when a person approaches you, it's thou. There's the I and there's the thou. And you become worship, and the worship you give is looking into the eyes where you find the Godhead in the eyes of. The, uh, of and that's an Eastern idea, too, that the Godhead enters you through the other in your presence. So both the Godhead, when we look inward, and the Godhead of the other, and if we don't concretize that, then we return once again to the principle of humility. And then we have choices. You know, then we have choices. Do I? What order do I give myself of to, to be in service to this life, but not so much to the exclusion of, of these other principles that exist without w- around me, where I can have an acceptance of that. You I'm know, really a culture, you uh, know, like we're a culture, like like you know James Hillman, who I alluded to earlier, the founder of the Post Jungian School of Archetypal Psychology, has a wonderful, painful to read book that he that he began at the beginning of of um, the Bush administration's uh, illegal and immoral ta- attack on the people of Iraq. It's called a terrible love of war, and in it he ruminates on what part of us, because because Aphrodite, um, backdoor man, whenever her husband leaves, the great craftsman god, have a stamp. Is whenever he leaves, through the back door comes the god of war, Ares, and they fall into a lover's bed together. Uh-huh. Why does Aphrodite love war? Why do we have a terrible love of war? James Hillman's wife told me this book nearly destroyed him. Because he had to go deep into the archetype of war, something he was repulsed by, but at the same time, in, at the same time, he had to understand where the warrior image came from, how it gets distorted in my, in my identity, especially after industrialization, and complete the book, which was the last, because it nearly destroyed him, of his original books he wrote on many subjects. So. It was like, where do we go into their self and find the acceptance of what we find anathema and then find what, a way that the warrior can be of service to the community, not an aggressor? 
you know, where do we where do we find that? And so how do we and how do we know that without going deep into the part of ourself of what we're mortified by and explore that? And that's what I mean by by having psyche, because if you go to you know, we're gripped and grappled at night by dreams that we are not controlling. You know, I wrote a poem recently where the you know, about being in 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 the in in the loam of Alabama and it comes through as the image of the dark night itself and the darkness of night and, and the image of a soil and the end of the poem and being confronted by the spirit of Choctaws and the other Indians in the culture and the li- the last line of the poem we must go to the dead and have them do with do with us what they will and that's what and that submitting to what the what the dead are asking for for us without losing our humanity is an aspect of the, the loss of psyche i'm talking about where the what we know what what we consider psyche as you were saying earlier is this ego consciousness that constantly needs to be inflated and i think the anal- the anal- you know, we can make that analogous to the bubble economy of capitalism where the bubble economy expands it collapses and the humiliation takes us to the brink time and time again of whether capitalism is going to go over to its shadow other of, fa- of fascism and I think that's what we we're witnessing to tie it into all these um, our men walking the streets that neither, you know, Trump gets political mileage of this. But what does Biden do the other day? He comes out against in a completely unnuanced look at why they're uprising, why the fire next time. And in, in typical Democrat form passes, you know, Trump is always going to be the more talented demagogue than Biden. So he essentially says, listen, I'm going to defer to Trump on this. And so when the so when some hyper authoritarian, which is the proclivity of of the uh, of the uh, the ruling class of the United States to come down on street protest, as I witnessed with the Obama administration, with my connection to Occupy Wall Street, um, where I saw five thousand militarized police enter the streets of lower Manhattan, tear up everybody's property in Zuccotti Park, you couldn't witness it firsthand because if you got anywhere near the scene, they'd arrest you. Destroyed every bit of property, every tent, every computer, took and mass people to jail. And and these um, paramilitary police stayed in the city for weeks on end. Every time Occupy Wall Street tried to open up in Union Square, then were the, there were militarized police from the NYPD showing up to immediately crush it again. So this phenomenon, what I'm saying, is not unique to Trump. Um, you know, fascism, fascism is inherent. It is always below the surface with capitalism. Um, it's just how much are the ruling class going to put an FDR in there that will put palliative progressive measures in it, zero socialist measures that might give autonomy and freedom of choice to the laboring class. They completely avoided that and gave the palliatives that pumped the economy up just enough to get to the the Second World War. And then the boom in the economy became afterwards because the rest of the world was an ash and rubble. So we're constantly, and I think right now in the United States, and one reason I have gratitude I had the ability to gain German citizenship because of what my ha- happened to my family during the Holocaust was um, that that we're we're seeing another phase where both the lack of the psyche and the humiliation uh, of capitalism, the failure uh, of Western democratic principles, which are impossible under capitalism. You cannot have capitalism in a democratic society because the um. The money class will always own and control not only cultural societal aspects that, that are dominant, but they will own and control the political class. And so, you know, within within that, the, the, the principle that we're going to vote away our, our troubles is, um, you know, though reality is fantasy, this is not a fantasy that serves us well. Right, right. And, and it seems as though the fantasy is shared by people on what they call both sides, you know, (laughs) and, and that, uh, to me, well, I haven't voted for a Democrat for president since 1992. 
Uh, I've never voted for a Republican. I've been outside of this for quite some time. And to me, I look at the scare tactics used by one party to scare the partisans into voting for them, you know, to scare them about the other party. And to me, it really just it looks exactly the same. Yeah, just it's, it's I mean, they're played with different chords. I mean, you know, I mean, but 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 still, you know, yes, we're get, we're getting this Wagnerian scale cataclysm <laughs> that, that 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 is promoted. And I mean, I, I, I I'm trying to to find the, the apt term for, for what goes on in the duopoly, where you're constantly having, as you said, this false division. But I mean, it's false division. I had to hark back to to Birmingham. There was a false division between the African Americans and the and the white underclass. The African Americans, of course, had suffered greatly. Uh, under slavery, under Jim Crow. So the white underclass was given a few more privileges. You know, they had the privileges. If you could find a way to serve the capitalist order, you you could maybe advance through the ranks as, as very few African-Americans could. But the vast majority of people were going to be held behind um, with, with the economic boot of capitalism on their throat all their life. And the men around me were going to be suffering with coal dust in their lungs. And and one way or another, used by the northern industrialists that made the profits that came from refining the ore that came out of the Appalachian Hills and it going back to banks in Pittsburgh and New York. And this distinction was made between um, African-Americans and the white working class that no empathy was allowed between the two um, and b- b- because of the tenet of Jim Crow. And we still practice that in a way. And I think it's, it's reflected in the, the, the party politics we have now where, you know, Nixon and others saw, um, saw George Wallace as who was an FDR Democrat who, who lamented late in his life that he, that he sold his soul to, to, to the white supremacist devil to to make the pronouncements he did. I don't think he ever really believed it, but he did lose his soul enough and became intoxicated by the lack of by by, by the need for um the need for power. Now it's interesting. One time when I was traveling around when I got my driver's license when I was younger, my, my friend and I and I, um it was either get get working class jobs in our neighborhood, get married to our girlfriend, or one night drink a little too much, throw our belongings into a 66, uh, 1966 um, Datsun station wagon, and we woke up in Alabama, right? Deep in, um, deep, deep, just didn't even know we were driving, just had been far too influenced by Jack Kerouac. <laughs> and, um, deep in um, the black belt of Alabama, which doesn't refer to the skin pigment of the people, but the black soil that was used to grow cotton that got lynched away. Hmm. And had some very interesting discussions at a country store with the locals who all were Wallace voters. And we asked them why. And they said, yeah, he talks all that shit, but he comes in here and uh, he put the water system over there and he opened the school over there. And he told us, I don't mean what I'm saying. I just that's just stuff I'm talking from those crackers. He literally said that. <laughs> And so, but but see, the thing is, is is I don't think Trump has that. I think Trump knows what he's doing. Uh huh. I think he is a racist. He was brought up in a racist family. You know, you can see, you know, you can see what he did with the Central Park Five. You could, this man is a racist. It was internalized, and and his she's shame based, and he feel because his father always crushed him and made him feel less than. He needs to displace that on losers and racial minorities, and he needs to feel – and he has this constant need to puff himself up into superiority and if these feelings of superiority to compensate for how crushed he is inside. But at the same time, I think he does know what he's doing, play, playing his base. I, I, I think he does – he is ignorant of something that liberals are – who are constantly referring to hillbillies and trailer trash and making all these all these snarky jokes about it. I don't know how many liberals I ran from the room reading them out when they used terms like that and told them they had no understanding what they were talking about of where 
these class differences come from. And you're a beneficiary of the privilege of where you were born, not born in Appalachia where I was. And so, you know, I mean, my, my wife, my wife's family that, like I said, she was born um, in, in a sharecropper shack before the family moved up in the world and built their own Jim Walter home, which I never met anybody in New York that knew what that was. <laughs> <laughs> but it's essentially, you know, it's a house you build yourself uh, that could come from the materials in the mail. That's, a, you know, pretty much a de facto trailer home that you build. But it it, it, it puts a roof over your head when, you know, the, the hundred year old shack that you've been living in has fallen apart. And so, but she early on had this feeling that I don't, you know, where it comes with some people. She read her first Dr. Seuss book and and all, all and, and went to the public library and dreamed of moving to, to New York and going to art school. But her family couldn't afford it, so she went to Atlanta and put herself through um, put herself through college at a fashion university where um, a fashion college where she could learn something and became a fashion designer that, uh, that led her then to becoming a computer animator where she was able, where she was able to move to New York and, and support herself. So, but most of her family didn't have that option. She just had, you know, where all the wings, she just had some part of herself that saw the world a little bit differently where the people that grew up around her accepted the, the landscape that was around them and what was offered. But I'll go and we'll go when I'm visiting the South. The men there understand climate change because their fingers are gnarled and bent back because they work outside all winter long. And then when the summer comes, they work in 110 degrees. And when I sit down and I tell them social, I tell them socialist tendons without using the word till the end. They're much more receptive to it than people, than liberals in New York that are immediately hostile and foaming at the mouth at, them, at me and foaming in the room or blocking me on Facebook. Right, right. I mean, and, I, and I, this is where we could just reach these people because they were born with racism. They will have black friends they knew all the way from school, but still respond to Trump's demagoguery about race. And, you know, they did lose their there are underpaid or did lose their jobs because of the victims of NAFTA that have come over of farm boys from Mexico that are taking the construction and other jobs. Their salaries were lowered. They are suffering. But nobody will talk honestly about the situation of why capitalism does that. And these are the these are the lines of demarcation that you were talking about to play out in Democratic and Republican working class and liberal class um, winner and loser that play all the way through. And as I was alluding to earlier, we can take this back to monotheism and we can take this all the way back to the flatheads that came into to South Carolina, the people that the Scottish people that, that when when Cromwell and others um, overthrew the throne that returned monarchy to Britain. Uh, we can we can take this all the way back to the southern tradition of the border Scots that went into uh, into the Ulster section of Ireland and, and set up plantations for the British and then did it into the American South and then became the, the so-called pioneers, the settler colonials that that help um, inflict genocide on my father's people. I mean, th the vastness of the story is Tolstorian in nature. And and it comes down to that's why we accept, I, in my opinion, we accept the duopolistic aspect uh, of, um, of that, that this is a linear thing. And because of pragmatism and we don't want to be purist, we're going to accept voting lesser to evil as if that's going to change the trajectory in the slightest. <laughs> In a state of shock after the war, we interrupt our program for a brief message. If you appreciate this podcast, please consider supporting Colibri on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Colibri. That's K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. -L -L and now, back to our regularly scheduled... <laughs> Yes, it's just, it's so distressing uh, at this. I mean, it's distressing to look at American politics at any time, but in this particular part where it's post convention and before the election, and apparently nothing else is going on in the world, you know, like that, that is just so frustrating because I'm like, okay, this is the part where we're just going to ignore 
everything that's actually a problem. And we're just going to look at this superficial contest between these, these two parties that are so identical that it's hard to tell the difference. And, and, and this year I feel like is the worst. I feel like this is the worst it's ever been of any 88 is the first election I remember. And this feels like the most extreme version yet of, Oh my God, the world's going to end if, if my candidate isn't elected kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just, yeah, I mean, look at it. It's like that sequence in Fantasia where, um, you know, where Mickey Mouse is the sorcerer's apprentice is trying to, you know, the water pails keep, you know, exponentially reproducing, right? Election season after election. I didn't think it could get worse than 2016. Did you? No. Did you think the Democrats <laughs> could find a, a worse candidate than Hillary? Well, leave it to the Democrats, right? I know. I mean, I mean, you know, I mean, John Kerry in 2004. Yeah. You know. I mean, so it was like this, this, and then you get, then you get a masterful, um, you get a masterful bait and switch artist like Obama and you, what you, where you text me earlier about um, Camilla Harris, you were asking me about that aspect. Yeah. They're hoping she'll be the Obama bait and switch artist. You know, that's what, and, and, I, and the, the Democrats are selling, you know, under the table, the idea that, that that Biden, who is an ambulatory hair plug in search of an operable brain, is somehow not going to either the fantasy that he's not going to make it through his term or that um, you know, after one term, somehow Harris will be able to run and get reelected. You notice how we entered the, the, the we're not dealing in good fantasy here. We're dealing in magical thinking. I mean, let's look at let, let's find a, a, a more gestalt fantasy here. Let's look at one of let's look at let's look at where we are as far and use the model uh, of, let's say, physics of the second law of thermodynamics. Now, naturally, let's look at Trump. Here's a figure of chaos when he he everything about this man when you listen to him, this is a disheveled wreck. This is an ambulatory tub of toxic goo that we're dealing with. Who better to embody the pathologies of one side of what the American experience has morphed into than Donald Trump from the striver salesman side that that um, goes through life as essentially a con man? On the other side of it, who provided the opening through his serial betrayals was Obama, who was another form of con man that appealed to a, a more a, a liberal sensitivity. And so we had the soft sell con man under Obama's doing the capitalist bait and switch. We have the more naked um, reality show host con man Trump reveal, pulling back America and revealing what is actually squirming and ugly beneath the surface. And then put in the, let's put in Biden, who is demonstrably on the cusp of senility, that talks in non sequiturs. That, that, I mean, this is, I mean, this is really the embodiment of the liberal imagination, isn't it? Of, of, of the failures of, of liberalism, first of all, that that that, that transmogrified into this nightmare of neoliberalism. And then we have Trump and we have so essentially we have two accelerants of the second law of thermodynamics facing each other. And the argument is only which is going to be the most effective accelerant to bring down this overextended militarist empire rotten to the core within both politically, economically, what is going to cause a collapse of that system um, that so it first may redefine itself. That's the first give, you know, somebody goes into, a, a, let's say, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Um, they essentially have to admit with the first three steps that they have screwed up their life, that, 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 that their, their thinking has caused their life to become unmanageable. It's they're living in this form of insanity that is hurting themselves and everybody around them. And then now what? How do I now learn to live in a new way? Because this is what rock bottom is about. Um, 
as we alluded to earlier, that's what ritual is about. So you don't have to hit rock bottom. Well, you know, is this election rock bottom? Because I've been wrong before. <laughs> I didn't think the American system could be holed up this long. I don't see how that's even possible, right? How it's how the last bust of the economy and the infusion that, that Obama and the oligarchs were able to infuse the economy to prop it up for this this long. But you saw the effect that it, it, it's now had on, on American culture where people are taking to the streets and pickup trucks Um armed to the teeth with automatic weapons that American men in some forms are so paranoid that they can't, they can't go down to the convenience store and get a burrito and a Mountain Dew without strapping automatic weapons on themselves. I mean, and I I remember one time we, I was, we had been living in New York for a matter of time. We had been traveling down to Atlanta to visit some family and my wife and I, we needed to get something at a target and an entire family in cameo and automatic weapons piled out of their pickup truck. You know? Wow. Mm-hmm. And, and, and this, this, was, this was 12 years ago, another time driving through Colorado as the fires were raging like they are now. Um, we, we, we were crossing into, we, we stopped off at a convenience for another family in Canamos. Their automatic weapons in their truck piled out, came, went to the convenience store where we were, fill, where we were filling up our gas, our, our Toyota with gas. They all came out with these, they weren't no longer, a foot long hot dog wasn't going to do anymore. Uh-huh. These were foot and a half long hot dogs. Uh-huh. <laughs> My wife and I are driving down the street, this over, uh, over, um, this overbuilt, overly large white pickup truck with the family in it eating their corn dogs are coming across and i said to my wife i said i bet if the world was on fire ahead of us they would not avert their eyes from those corn dogs this is what happened to us and a few miles down the road was the first of a series of the biggest fires in california in colorado history starting the fire literally was threatened to sweep across the highway we were on. We were able to make it um, to Glenwood Springs, Colorado for the night, um, slept through the night. We left, headed through Kansas again and up to, up through Nebraska, back up into Pennsylvania, into New York. The next morning, I heard that Glenwood Springs had, offens- um, had um, burned down practically. Um, in New York, the flames, the, the fire, the, the New York was was full of a gauze of smoke um, for weeks after that from that fire in Colorado. And so th- how, the way that we've had been winnowed down to winnow down, as I, as I was speaking about earlier with the gun culture, that you look down the barrel of the gun and you feel some sensors, the heft of the, the rifle, the feeling of being able to look down the sights, the feeling of control that you have in these situations where you're in your oversized pickup truck, the air condition is blasting in your face. Maybe somebody, a number of people in the family are taking um, um, serotonin and re-up inhibitors, right? Right. So you're, you know, you're not going to feel, you're driving by a homeless person, or are you going to feel empathy? Maybe you're even driving through a, 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 the starting of a wildfire connected to, to global cl- climate chaos, what what are you going to experience at that moment? You know, this is where I say where the, the descent into the cave that, that that the First Nations people have, where you find some way to go down into the darkness and you see what connection you have with all things. You know, this is the this is the ritual that's needed. And and as far as you know, the conversation about duopoly, um, it, this is as far as we keep we winnow things down to the degree that we believe we can control them. But, you know, let's face it, on a good day, we can control our bowels and our bladder. We should have gratitude for that. <laughs> and, right. And, and so here, here we have, you, you can go out and you can help some feral cats in the world and you can, and you can help the world return to th- th- through planting actual seeds in the ground. See, I think what you're doing is so poetic and profound and there's an eloquence to what you're doing because we're taking these generational seeds and this generational knowledge and we're going to make remake the world in an old way like those roots reaching down into what's existed here since the formation of the earth itself 
which was blasted out in the Big Bang and is a part of us. And those roots reaching down to the very beginning. But the flower comes up through the evolutionary process, looking and smelling in a particular way in the environment around it. The, the flower that smells in this particular way and draws the bee to it, that pollinates the earth, that is adapted in a particular type of way to that which includes being reborn in an ever-changing world through mutations. That's why we weirdos are so important. <laughs> you know, us that, that, that just, you know, the, the, most of the mutants just don't make it. But every once in a while, a mutant strain of a, a slightly different beak reaches a little bit deeper in it to get the seed and it passes that on to its offspring that's what we're doing every moment of our lives if we connect ourselves to th those roots that go deep into the underworld and that part of our, our winged self that sees to the end and they can see as far as we're allowed to see because think about it we're not we're it's we're just not very good if we took a lot of mushrooms and we took them for so long or we took LSD like Ram Dass did to the degree that he forgot even his name and Ram Dass came in. I'm this name now. I don't know who that Richard Alpert fellow is. <laughs> that, you know, we're going to lose our connection to the human. And so, and then the fact that this interplay, that we lose our connection to the self, the aspect of what humanness is redefined within the totality of these things that we keep returning to, that's why we need the weirdos and the poets and the musicians to do this non verbally. And we, you know, when, when, when you listen to those last concertos of, of Beethoven, you listen to those things, though he had gone deaf, he is, and he was still firmly in this world, he was still mutant enough in the next to bring us that. And so you, 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 when you, when you hear these mutant strains that grow out of the soil, like rock and roll and jazz, I mean, I mean, when, when, when I listen to Coltrane, I go, that's the that's the height of human potential right there. If we could only find some way to communicate this on a mass level, that all is cold terrain, all is this man that worked out the techniques by falling asleep with with, the, with this with his with his musical instrument of choice in his lips, to the point that his lips spread, woke up and played it again. If we could only get to that place where, through the refinement of technique and the intrusion of a larger order, then we can begin to redefine ourselves on a daily basis that way and not get locked in to this thinking that we're either liberal or conservative, leftist or rightist. I think it is time, it, important really. Now, with the caveat, at times when the barricades are being manned and you have to choose what side you're going to be on, but always with the understanding of this, because, we, because the war is going this way, and there's not going to be war all the time. We've got to lay down our sword and shield, redefine ourselves as what peace is. And then how do we become warriors for peace? And then how is it that we adapt to this ever changing landscape in front of us? And I just think when we're dealing with democracy and I'm listening to these preposterous arguments about 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 like, you know, we have to vote for Biden in this particular type of clever liberal class casuistry comes into it. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm baffled as to as to how do you even reach these people on their level with with, with without putting them in a sensor depri deprivation tank and putting on coal train. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, personally, I don't have a problem with if someone wants to spend the five minutes or 10 minutes or whatever it is to to, to vote. I mean, fine, go ahead and, and do that. It's the it's the. Uh, how how it dominates the conversation and the news cycle and you know drives which I have to admit I'm guilty of falling into sometimes right oh me too <laughs> me too I know because it's there and I feel like responding to it but yeah it's just afterwards I just want to hug my kid and said I'm sorry I did that <laughs> 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 you know? and it's you know it's like I should have been with you I mean I mean you know so the thing is that that. I get into this because there's a part of me that, you know, had to be political to exist in Alabama, my fa being pulled into the civil rights movement, as we were by the actions of my father. Old ladies in our neighborhood are, you know, holding out sugar cookies from us and explaining why, um, to use their words, this Martin Luther, this Martin Luther King Kong is the Antichrist. 
Wow. And mm-hmm. the, and I mean, I remember vivid memories of being five, six, seven years old and, and sweet old cotton haired colored um, co- co- cotton with her hair, cotton hair, hair. We used to call them cotton hairs, white hair that you don't see around as much anymore. I don't know where the cotton heads went to <laughs> the, the, these old white women. And they would be go grand sweet old grandmothers were offering you the cookies to stay baked and you'd listen to their sermons about now listen about this rice mixing did god have cats and dogs get married children and i'm of course going well they're different species (laughs) and they're going well that's you're just a smart ass because you're half jew (laughs) wow Uh uh-huh And 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 then they tell you all about the mark of Cain, which which somehow black people you could look at their hands and and see that. And I'm just baffled by this mythology. I mean, it's no crazier that I remember my father and I were walking in the woods one time, and he he put me up on a rock, and the story of Abraham came to me about he was going to sacrifice his son. And I looked real hard in the horizon before I freaked out for the angel of death. Right. Right. <laughs> And so it was like, you know, you hear these stories and they get into you and they're the stories of, of this toxic mythos of Birmingham, Alabama. And when, when I was growing up with these old ladies that actually believed they were on the side of Jesus because of their racism. And so being political and being aware and looking at my father's pictures in, in Life magazine and then uh, and asking my family about this and having my mother ha- tie it to the Holocaust and her and her journey to first um, um, World War Two era Britain. And then her, the boat she took to New York City after that and putting that in the context, the civil rights movement, the racism of the South and having a house full of books, I think uh, is the part of myself which I am not. I'm not ashamed of, and I am going to go into the political breach because of that. Um, but the whole time, having, you know, since I went a little Shakespearean there, the whole time realizing what is this short dance upon this earth? Who am I? am a player here. I have this, this short stage play, to paraphrase the bard. Um, you know, it's sometimes I, I have to be like Prospero in his books. I I sometimes have to, to take all my magic and, and allow um, my daughter to get married to everything I thought I ran away from, you know, like Prospero. I, I always have, have to be in this place of both shipwreck and thinking I'm I'm in this place where I have an understanding in my magic works on, on this isolated aisle, but then the world intrudes in, in the form of Ferdinand and the, the, the man that something inside of me in, in you know metaphoric form, well, it would be interesting late in life for it to happen literally, right? But, right. Um, but in, the, in the form that where am I going to give my Eros to next, even though I thought I knew every, everything I thought I knew was in these books. So as, an, as I age, I'm constantly in the position of Prospero. I'm constantly giving my last soliloquy before I, I have to pronounce what I thought I knew to be unworkable. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, I was um, two weeks old when the uh, Stonewall uprising broke out in uh. New York City. And I've always felt as though uh, something, I, I caught something of that spirit at that time, you know? I was, that I, well, yeah. That I felt that yeah. spark, you know? And and so, and, and of that one in particular, you know? And, and, and so I have also felt that political urge, you know, or, or, or drive my whole life, but it is that urge, you know, pursuing that, which has brought me to the point of being like, but there's no real choice within the context of, of, of U S political, of the U S political scene. It just, it has no, all of our problems are deeper. All of our, you know, the systemic stuff is so much larger and to focus on these personalities you know, is to distract ourselves from the real issues and from the real work. The real soul making of it. Yes. I mean, but I think it's all part of it because, you know, let, let me, you know, um, go, to, go, to go with the idea of morphic resonance. Right. And Sheldrake's ideas. I, I don't know whether this is literally true, but I like the fantasy that like where in different parts of the world, different parts of the world, one monkey learns to wash its fruit and then on archipelago islands not connected to it 
other monkey, other female monkeys are washing their fruit. And that, you know, anybody that's ever written, I don't know how many times I thought up coming something original. Like I wrote, a, you know, I used to write a lot. Of, I still write a lot of songs, but I used to, you know, um, tour with people who perform them and stuff that I would think as I was working on a song or a poem or a short, short story that I'd written, somebody else was working on that, was picking up this, whatever it was out of the morphogenetic fields, out of the zeitgeist, whatever you want to call it. And these forms start coming into the world that in different places. <laughs> and so I, I have no trouble believing that there was something in the air at the time of your birth that, that, that uh, you know, some stone that penetrated the dimensions that came through and you were throwing stone, you know, you're throwing stones and bricks in the womb. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're, they're, you know, they're, they're the, the Stonewall uprising. You know, I mean, I, I, I without a doubt, I think that, that there's a part of me that, has an understanding of even though my father was torn away from from um, the First Nation culture and then brought up by brought up by a Protestant father and a, and a, and a Jewish mother until the, the Protestant father stroked out when when my father was 12 and they ended up in a, a Jewish community in Birmingham. And that that mix of things with my father's life, even though I did not know and my father did not discover later that part of his ancestry when when an uncle of, when, when an uncle of him told him not till the 1970s we always knew my father looked different we knew he was adopted but my father had the ongoing fantasy that he was roma huh. until until his his gay uncle dick who had moved to paris to get away from the insanity of america way back in way back in the 60s and became a professional bridge player was visiting one time in the 70s and said no no let me tell you about your your history and then my and I and it's a strange thing because before that incident, I, that incident I told you about where I woke up in Alabama and well, my friend and I traveled around and one time we 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 were in up we were in, in Upper Missouri, we had stopped off. It had been eighteen year olds was the drinking age in Georgia where we were we were from, but we we stopped in in this place it was twenty one and they wouldn't sell us a six pack of beer. We go back to the car. There's a knock on the window. Um, we roll it down. There, there is a um, a man standing there, and he says, "You want a beer?" And we said, "Yeah, sure." And he says, "Well, you know." So we made an arrangement. We gave him the money. He bought a twelve pack. We sat at the back of the convenience store, um, talking with these men, and they looked. Every one of them looked like my father. And I, w I remarked that to him. I said, it's really strange. And this is before I heard the story from Uncle Dick. Ah. Um, and they had the same way his mustache grew. They were Lakota tribe. And, you know, if I'd not been a young man and then anxious to get to the next place, we would have, I would explore. But I didn't know that. I just thought it was strange. I also see people from Peru who look like my father. Two men I have run into, and one of them I get scared the hell of in the subway in New York because he looked so much like my father a young, when my father was younger. I walked up and said, where are you from? And, I, and it scared him because he thought I might be ice, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then I said, oh, no, 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 look at me. I mean, I'm not – I'm certainly not from ice. You just look exactly like my father, right? And it happened one time at a Christmas market here in Germany, actually, that some people from Peru were selling their wares. So – it was like, and I said, do you see that? And I said to my, my, my son, I said, man looks exactly like, and I, then I had a long conversation, but he was from Peru too. So there's, there was some, you know, that, 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 that these stories, and like I said, the ongoing, the ongoing fantasy is my, in my father's life is till later in life, till he was middle age, he did not know. And then after that, he started traveling around when, when, well, he had, a, he really could never handle Western culture. He had a number of breakdowns. One time was actually institutionalized till he just he actually did what, what what the Indian character did did in um and went flew over the cuckoo's nest he he just left <laughs> and came home but it wasn't till uh, he couldn't he really couldn't get himself together after the turmoil of the 60s where his photographer his friends in photography were going to Vietnam he didn't go because a friend of his was shot and paralyzed in the back and that was the job that was offered he tried to live a middle class life for selling real estate kept having nervous breakdowns because of it and then things got better for him after uncle dick told him the story and then he began traveling around and staying at various reses and it, you know his life began to make a little bit more sense for him 
but he was still had this orphan rage and and all of that confusion. And so, you know, when I when I look at American culture, I think my father and my family are embodiments of the trauma of the 20th century. And so when we look at this and how what do you deal with tra- do you trauma? And this alludes to what we were talking earlier. First, you have to go and talk to the ghosts. You have to see what they're about. And all these ghosts that are haunting the American um, the American landscape and are revealed and it's completely alienated, disconnected from reality politics. Essentially, what we're dealing with here is, you know, Allen Ginsberg said this way back as the 60s were happening, says the culture's having a nervous breakdown and it's been having one ongoing. I just can't believe that it's held itself together for this long. You know, I think I think, you know, that, that but but as I, you know, as we if you look at the science of climate change um, and you look at what's happening to California now and you look at the the language that nature speaks, which is something that's been lost and diminished by, by a mechanistic view of the world and is getting worse as people compare themselves to machines as opposed to how nature renews itself. What's going through in that in those wildfires here, and what can we create out of the ash and mulch that's left afterwards? How do we let the wildfire burn through us through our passions? And then what you know, and I think you're you're very aware of this, and it's exquisite. What do we put in soil? And so to return this to duopoly, this the only solution I can come to is that people have to be convinced to give up on the Democratic Party. Right. And and it has to be composted. It has to be burned away. The ashes and the compost have to be mixed in the soil where we put the seed in. We cultivate the seed and bring a leftist, progressive, socialist party up, you know, and whatever morphing form politics might take. And we allow that to bloom and give it and, and allow the Democratic Party to go to the landfill of history because you know the re- reactionary republicans this isn't just going is not the way it is going to happen for them but the, the people that that are and, and i i just think that that there are some people that are more capable of surrendering to the process of transformation than others and the people that that grasp that that you can grasp it in southern culture i came from I used to like Elvis. I used to love to go to the Pentecostal churches and watch the ritual and the music, mm-hmm. especially the black Pentecostal churches. And there's a metaphor there, but drowning in the baptism and you come up reborn, except they literalize it into this monotheistic religion. Well, how do we take that same process, which we've already been drowned once, according to that scripture? And as Baldwin said, the fire next time. Okay, then what? Then what? How do we turn this fire into a phoenix? And and as far as winnowing it down to American political landscape, the best I can do at this point, when people invariably say, "Well, you make all of these these very cogent critiques about American duopoly," but what is the solution? Well, we have to destroy the Democratic Party. It's not going to be reformed. It can't be. It's not possible because of the structure of neoliberal capitalism and American militarism, where Democrats have even become the more aggressive war party. They have become the more war aggressive war party at this point, too. Yeah. And that's uh, a particularly heartbreaking thing for me is to see how there is virtually no anti-war movement left. This was this was the legacy of Obama was destroying the anti-war movement. And I believe that the legacy of Obama was also uh, to basically destroy the environmentalist movement because we have neither at this point in the United States. Yeah. I mean, I think I would taste back the destruction of, I mean, this happened, Obama, yes, the the anti-war movement that happened under Bush Cheney that showed how superficial and partisan it was once the Democrats took over in 2006. Right. (laughs) But, um, but, the, you know, I remember the seeds of this is being very being young. Our family had moved out of Alabama to Atlanta um, and I would go to Piedmont Park where the Almond Brothers would play um, their music on on, you know, the, the, the cracker version 
of the BNs that started about 1969-70 in Atlanta. And so there was always the Quakers and they're staying, they're helping young men avoid the draft. And so there was a fledgling anti-war movement, even in the deep South that I was exposed to in, in, in Atlanta. And then though, around the, 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 the 70s, this, the, this, this mythos started about the veterans being spat on when they came back and the liberals embracing this story about how meanie pants hippies were spitting on these men. I mean, think about the plausibility of this. The, these, you know, the, the, these scrawny hippies, you know, which were always being called commie faggots, right? Mm-hmm. And we are we are attacking veterans. We're spitting on them that just turned return from the killing zones of Indonesia. You know, this just was never a plausible story. So, and then the Rambo, Chuck Norris myth started about, you know, think about this, about something was left in Vietnam. Yeah, the truth was about that American culture isn't facing and you have to go find these tortured POWs and release them. And we this fantasy that we won the war again and Sylvester Stallone's character in Rambo saying, are you let us win this time? Well, the war was unwinnable. That's why the that's why the American empire left and then they blamed it on the anti-war movement somehow jane fonda going and demoralizing the american veterans and the and american soldiers in the field by embracing the Viet Cong. and this this narrative that this false narrative started way back with with the with, with the breaking of the anti-war movement and then as you as you rightly pointed out obama you know obama bringing back the same lies and the same this this is the the hagiography of american soldiering which is a vast con game. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I grew up in a, I, I had a draft card. I mean, I, I'm old enough to still have a draft card, which they gave us in high school. And, um, I, and I, I, one night with my, a couple of friends of ours, we, we, um, same story. We drank a little too much headed for a camping trip with being the South. We had our guns. We set our draft cards on the end of the dock and shot them. on. <laughs> <laughs> And they, and we, we turned around. It's a good thing we we're white boys because the entire sheriff and police departments of this local rural area had heard there was gunfire going off at this lake, and they surrounded us with their weapons. Uh-huh. <laughs> and of course, once we were, if we would have been black, we'd been dead probably. Right. But what I'm just saying is, is growing up in this southern culture, um, where nobody questioned the military except me, you know, where it was, and a few other people. But there was this idea that that even though the South had been on the wrong side of history in the Civil War and then had naturally become the fodder, that it, it had no chance in society. So they joined the military and having a deep Southern that goes all the way back to the Ulster Scots and the Border Scots War with the British of being militaristic going on in the South is this unquestioning, hagiographic look at soldiers, that they're all heroes. No, that no, they're they're victims of empire, like the poor people that they kill, whose whose countries they destroy, and that's always the 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 the, the tension point. If I remember being having my first job in construction when I was eighteen, um, and dig, being in a hole with an, with another guy that we, he was black, he was my height, I'm five foot four, he was five foot four, and we're in this hole digging in it. We're digging, we're softening the earth a dirt ditch after a ditch witch came through, and we're laying cable. And he's in there, and he's he, he was a Vietnam vet, and he said he looks at me and says, Phil, you, you'd have been like me. You'd have been a tunnel rat. I said, what's a tunnel rat? And he said, well, small guys, they sent into the VC tunnels. Oh, wow. And he said, and he said, uh, he said it, it was a death sentence. I said, well, Wally, you're standing here. And he said, and he said, yes, yeah, because I fragged that MF <laughs> lieutenant. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I didn't know what the word was. He had to define it for me. And it was all and the guys in my neighborhood that, you know, being a working class neighbor, they they had been Vietnam veterans, too. And a lot of them practically never left the house after that and only got through because of the grace of Quaaludes because of the deep trauma they were in. So there were a lot of anti-war forces and reinforcements about what the military actually does to people and what it took to survive. But, and you're right, Obama was all part of that military hagiography that you can trace back to the 70s 
as the American war machine found a way, new new ways to sell propaganda, and that it was somehow it was somehow um, traitorous and untoward and even immoral in its own way to question a veteran. Where you know a lot of these guys, I mean, I mean, just it, it's such a sad story about they come back and they carry unless they're you know, unless they're psychopaths, they carry their conscience around. Um, about what happened and what they witnessed, and you see what, and you see what the culture at large is is done is attempting to do to the founder of WikiLeaks as we speak. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, they're, they're they're deep. You're going to be punished, um, and there's going to you're going to be harshly punished in one way or another, marginalized like we are in the left, right? Even more so now because of the publications we write to. Due to Google logarithms, right? Right. <laughs> we're going right. to be marginalized in, in in ways that way, but we're going to be harshly marginalized. I mean, look at look at um, look at Robert Perry's story of being fired from Newsweek and and the Washington Post that you and I were texting about earlier for breaking the October surprise. Yep. Um, you're going to be either your careers are going to be destroyed. You're going to be marginalized. And we look back to all of us. This is the root of the job. You have to a guy I knew that was one of the founders of the recovery movement in the southeast, a very brilliant mentor of mine called Tom Butcher. He would always give this thing about the about what's working on you in the psyche when you're driven to take some medicating drug that. And he said he said one time coming from Biloxi, Mississippi, was while I was in town and everybody was having this fealty to this one individual who was the boss. And he said, "You tr- everything everybody did, you could trace back to this particular political boss in Biloxi, Mississippi. And he says, you always go back you, and you use the Watergate expression, you follow the money, you see who's pulling the strings. And in capitalist society, you follow the money and you can follow the direct trajectory of what goes on in duopoly, the false narratives that go on about the, of the U.S. military and the hero status of everybody in uniform. You can trace this to the prison and in, prison industrial state. You can trace it to Jim Crow. You can trace it as we were speaking to the duopoly that allows all of this white supremacy and militarism to exist and to expand itself. Trace it back to who is the pro- who are the profiteers? Right, and Smedley Butler was could, talking uh, uh, about this in the '30s. Who was who was Smedley Butler? You know, war is a racket. Oh yeah, yes, right. He was saying that originally. You know, um, Utah Phillips put it in another way. He says these people that are destroying the earth have names and addresses. And you know, the Unabomber kind of took that literally, which I wouldn't do. But. Right. But it's just like, you know, these people do have names and addresses. We can we can find where they are and we can find. And this is the hardest thing for I think for all of us. What is my complicity in this? Right. Because I have complicity. You know, I mean, I was you know, I, I, I certainly, um, you know, make my kid happy by buying him too many plastic toys, you know, which are made of oil. And then at the next moment, I'm looking at him and I'm, I'm, I'm staying up night afterwards, staring bug guy at the feeling, uh, ceiling about what his future is going to be as all this chaos comes down the line. Right. You know, he was begging to go to for the for, for, went to return to school for a Scooby Doo, you know, um, house. Right. Because he just adores Scooby Doo as as a rite of passage. Right. Don't trust. Because usually behind this in Scooby Doo, the capitalists are behind it, right? Right, it's true. <laughs> you pull up the mask. There's somebody, as people have pointed out, there's somebody who wants to make a profit. <laughs> so he, you know, and so he got that for for a school a opening school gift. And I'm having this conflicting feelings that consumerism making has made him happy, and I worry all night about what his future is going to be. Maybe there won't be this type of world that can even produce that and he's going to have to go back to a more simple way which would probably be better for him because I, I have this fantasy all the time of leaving the city and just becoming those those people that heal themselves with horses right uh-huh. <laughs> you know I mean and I think you've done that to some degree and I'd love to 
have a, a conversation where we can explore what you've learned from that. You know, I mean, I, I mean, I'm sure that I don't. What, what did you grow up in a city? I grew up in in a city. I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska, in in the city, and then at a young age was moved to the suburbs. And there we were on the very very edge of the suburbs, so it was hayfields next to us. So I got to play in like a rural area as a child, which was great because there's lots of insects. There was barbed wire. Mm -hmm. There was old abandoned tree houses. I mean, it was it, that was a good part to 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 get you know and and my. Um, my parents and especially my mother were plant people. They were always planting mm -hmm. things and always putting in gardens and food and this and that. So my first vegetable garden was when I was six years old, actually. Mm -hmm. That made a big difference. And I remember digging in the soil to plant that first garden and finding an arrowhead. You know, mm, you too. And, yeah, and this was in Omaha, <laughs> Nebraska. So they're, they're they yeah. were there, you know, and oh, so certainly, yeah. So Omaha, that's a that's a that's a First Nations name, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, and so is so is Nebraska. That was there. It was Nebraska, yeah, and that was their word for the Platte River. It means flat, flat water. You know, and so, yeah. so yeah, and so I've 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 I felt that connection from from a young age too, because the plant connection is really as I've grown older, that's been become the sort of prominent thing for me is the connection to plants and wanting to work with plants. Uh, at first, it was through gardening and farming. And then after discovering that, oh, wait a minute, there's other ways where we're not really trying to control and dominate the plants, but we're trying to work with and cooperate mm. with the plants. Yeah. That's the difference. That's the wild tending. That's the 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 gathering you know, hunting and, part. and the touching and the contemplating the green fuse that connects you with right. the green music of the soul. Right. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and there's a definite humility in that. And there's definitely a, uh, I am no better, you know, than these, these things that I'm with, you know, and they all have spirits and they all have voices and I am just one thing with them and they're older than me. Cause there's also this sense mm. You know, there's also this yeah. sense, you know, especially with trees of them. Being, well, these uh, are our elders. You know what I mean? Yes. But the grasshopper is my elder, too. The grasshopper's been around for for what, 50 million years or more. Right. Yeah. So. So, right. I mean, yeah. So so interacting with like that. And then so so that that really brings about that brings about not pleasure, but that brings about some kind of contentment or something sense of belonging perhaps that i have never found within human culture and so connecting with the plants is a way of not feeling alienated in life anymore yeah i mean the peace sur surpasses all understanding i think is how it's put about yeah that, yeah growing up i'm mean, like i said alabama we moved to the other side of the mountain and um then, then in a section now we had no money because people hear this and they think I'm a rich kid from Alabama. No, we lived in a little apartment complex in a neighborhood called Mountain Brook. Mm -hmm. And if you know Birmingham, you think that's rich. But no, we in my earliest childhood, we did not have any of that. We lived in a small apartment complex, but the back of it was a creek and a woodland. Mm, yeah. And there were, and there were copperheads back there and water moccasins in the creek and fish that I could go fishing. Crawdads. Crawdads, all of that. And I would and I so I had that same experience when my father and I would go would travel sometimes because he had got he had when he was still had the business or the scrap metal business and then after that with his back when he traveled on photography we go on fishing expeditions and we would ask maybe a rural black farmer whether we could fish on the part of the, 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 the lake or a creek that went to his land. And we'd always bring him some fish afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then we'd sit, we, we'd sit with them, with people and talk. And this understanding of they, they would invariably talk about Jesus. And so I got this understanding of what Christians actually at their best mean by Christ is this Christ is like a seed. He goes in the ground. He grows his life at the flowering of his being. He's cut down and the seed is left and it grows again and is reborn. And we'd sit on the porch and be snapping beans to cook with the fish. And Christ was as real to the, the these people in rural Alabama as the snap beans beneath their fingers. And, you know, it's very sublime you're getting that experience. And that's what I want my kid to have. We're, we're here in Munich, which is a much more livable city. I had some people convince me that, that were followers of my writing to move here and not to move to Berlin. But there's some things I regret because it's a highly bourgeois city 
And there are a lot of parks that he can get some of that with. And, you know, with the limited money we have, we I don't have enough to travel. And then since the lockdown, geez, you know. Right. But there's some deep there's some a whole forest culture here in Germany that if you have ancestry, you probably know about, you know, where the where the Grimm's fairy tales came from mm-hmm. and a whole connection of the forest to to the Teutonic mind. So, you know, I, I intend when we can finally get our vaccines or whatever it's going to take to get beyond this to make some deep exploration of that. But because I want my son to experience what you and I had there. Mm-hmm. Of you know my 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 grandmother was a guard my my grandmother on my maternal side was a gardener and that family had their guard they were out once you could put seeds in the ground or grow things in the cold you know the cold soil like you actually can in Georgia you know you can have your turnips come in at, at, you know at a lot of times during the year you can have you know so there are things you can even grow in in the coldness of winter so they're my wife's family as I said they sustain themselves on doing work and they always had huge gardens where people bartered somebody had some chicken they they had had a lot of had a lot of beans and tomatoes people would be bartering to make the food along in the 80s with their government cheese too you know right but, mm-hmm. but so you know that 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 that's a very strong part and it's something i've actually when i was touring around and i could tell the songwriters that grew up strictly in the suburbs the songwriters that grew up in the country and the ones that grew up in the city. Ah. Mm-hmm. And because there were the, the the way that nature flowers and transforms and the way uh, the asymmetry of a flying bird sometime, the, the, the rural writers had that. The suburban writers had a cul-de-sac. <laughs> right. And they had this mall experience and the urban writers and I'm not I'm not criticizing this, but their rhythm, the, the way they were drawn to rhythm was in a different way because you're always stopping at a light. You're always having a grid experience. Mm-hmm. And that's something one thing going lucky enough where I grew up into where the, the, the roads were made by Indian trails. Um, I remember one time I was doing some filming of some videos my wife and I did, and we were traveling around in old, my old neighborhood uh, outside of, you know, the first suburb, Medlock. You hear the Scottish aspect in that, the Scott Irish aspect of Medlock was the neighborhood. It was the working class neighborhood that that fed working class white kids in, into my high school. And we, we were I was driving around. I was talking about the various memories of the place. And I said, see, look at the way the streets move in here. The, the, these were started from Indian trails and then became places to move mules along. And the name of a street, just as I was saying this, as we approached a street of a name I had long forgotten over the decades, it was called Indian Trail Road. And so I would always tell people I can never become a New Yorker because the grid plan here, my, my Appalachian Piedmont mind cannot there are, you know, you completely, they flattened Midtown. They went from lower Manhattan and they flattened Manhattan, which meant land of many hills in native lexicon. Oh, I had no idea. It was completely leveled up to Midtown. It was unrecognizable uh, as far as what the landscape was. And then a grid plan was put up there. Um and I was saying that no matter how long, you know, because I've been coming and living in New York for a time, period of time since since the 80s and coming back and forth and living in L.A. and living in the South again. But when my wife and I moved back there in the late 90s, um, that for as long as I'll be in New York, you, you can I can I can understand the rhythms of the city, but you will never make me a New Yorker. <laughs> and the reason was because I, I have internalized these Indian trails and that you just, just my, my mind is like that the peaks and valleys of Appalachia and about the Piedmont Hill country. And I can never live in that. This place is haunted. I, I know these ghosts because of my, my ancestors, but Ashkenazi and Sephardic ancestry from Europe. But, and I know the ghosts that haunt these streets, but the landscape is never, even when I go into the new outside of the city, into the Catskills or further into the new England woods, this this is going to be a beautiful sublime for me and the plants, but the the family plants that I know are, are the way that, that light filters through the pines or the 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 the, 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 the way that the tulip poplars grow grow up and, and pierce the southern sky, 
and the way that landscape looks as opposed to the you know the, the the way this landscape of maple trees looks here in the northeast which i love which is you know and california where you're from boy are you living in california did i get that right i, I lived in california and oregon for uh i spent most of the last 20 and years there oregon yeah now, mm-hmm. that's right yeah that's an alien landscape i, I mean <laughs> that that terrain when i get to, when i get there there's there. I have the sublime of feeling like I'm in a Ray Bradbury story. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Cause I feel uh, to me going out there and discovering those places felt like coming home in a way. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's something yes. about those. Well, there's something about those places where they're not as impacted, you know, as the, yeah. that's the least impacted part of, of the U S when it comes to settler colonialism, where things are most, sort of intact, you know, so it took me a little while, but then I, I felt a deeper connection to those places than I felt to other places. Although there's definitely times when I would miss the wide openness of Nebraska uh, and feel a little claustrophobic maybe from time to time. Yeah, my wife, know? when we went through there, could not, she comes from swamp country. Mm-hmm. She could not understand it at all. Right, right. I mean, she was just going, oh my God, how do you not, not go crazy? There's so much sky. And but I remember the, when I was in Oregon the first time, I was did this ongoing musical poetry tour of forty eight states every six months, and we were in Eugene, I believe, uh-huh. and there was that con- contrast between the university town and the lumber town, right? And right. you know the lumber industry that went around there, and I recognized the Yahoo culture, the the kind of angry violence that that lurked within men that were told that your your job is dependent where i'm from and destroying this mountain and they're you know clear cutting yeah and then it was explained to me by by somebody that grew up there and i did not know this they said that, that a huge white supremacist supremacist movement had left the south after after reconstruction because it had been ruined by the carpetbaggers and they went to oregon now you probably know more about that than me but the, I mean, how yeah. much truth is there in that? It, yeah. Well, the original, uh, the original Constitution in Oregon forbade black people from owning property there, and I think that wasn't changed until the 1960s. And there were also uh, the, the idea was that there there were people who wanted to make a white utopia there, a white only mm-hmm. utopia. And so there's places like White City in Southern Oregon, and there's places that um, a lot of those towns had white crosses in them, you know, yeah. like when you come up to the town. Eugene still has its white cross, actually. It's up on a up on a hill uh, close to downtown. But yeah, the, the um, you know, people are, you know, think of Portland as a liberal and are surprised to hear about the the right wing fascists who've been coming there. But that has been the white history of Oregon uh, from from way back, yeah, has been has been these white supremacists, and you go out to Eastern Oregon, and it's like you know it's ninety three to ninety five percent white, you know, with a small mm-hmm. amount of Native American, a small amount of Latino, mostly connected to the agricultural industry, and then a very small number of Black people and Asian people, um, and there were actual massacres of Asian people, Chinese uh, especially, in the late 1800s in, in Oregon, uh, because, mm. you know, they would they came out to work in the mines and on the railroad. And then when those projects ended, or there wasn't as much gold, oh, okay, now we're gonna now we're gonna shoot you, you know, and so wow. uh, yeah, some really terrible things, you know, happened, happened there, you know, the the landscape is 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 gorgeous. And in eastern Oregon, there are also there are Native Americans out there, who have their reservations actually on their original lands. So, you yeah. know, out east, a lot of the Indians got moved, force moved to like Oklahoma or whatever. Uh, and in Oregon, some of them were fortunate enough to merely have their territories shrunk, you know, so they yeah. still actually yeah. have portions of their original territory and therefore are more intact, you know, as cultures. And so I've been able to meet some of these folks too. And that's been really, you know, fascinating uh to, to see how they haven't lost as much and and how they're they're now also able to there there, there is a renaissance in people the uh, and a lot of the younger native americans wanting to reconnect as well and that's been a great thing to see yeah well i mean the catastrophe of western culture yeah that's what it is you know, i mean i mean we have i mean so it's just like the like some like some people so many people say why are so many millennials now embracing socialism well 
you know, the, the, you hear a lot of disparaging snark about young people living in their parents' basement. But, you know, that they've met the capitalist economy for what it is. Yeah. And they're not needed like my wife's side of the family were needed to be mill workers. And they were, you know, and the children went to that and and there, were, there was the you could find a way to exploit children in early capitalism. Like, for example, when the English commons were cleared, um, cleared and the people were sent to industrial cities and, you know, you had horrible, horrible outbreaks of contagious disease and the lifespans dropped 25, 30 years. Um, but there was no alternative now. With young people, there are no factories to exploit them in, right? And so, and so they 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 have that they're feeling the full effect that if you want a job, what are you going to go do? You're going to go work in the service industry and not make enough money to to, to pay these hyperinflated rents because the landlord culture rules everything. So they live with their parents' home. They live with that humiliation. Unfortunately, so many of the young men, you know, that are disparagingly called incels because women grown up in materialism understandably say, I need somebody that can make at least an equal income for me to be able to pay the bills or I live in constant angst. Right. I mean, it's interesting. The root word of, uh, of anxiety, angst, comes from a, back to the Greek uh, of um, the Greek figure of Anaki, who was who was the the goddess of necessity. You didn't they they, they had no temples to necessity to, to to Naki because you you there's no way you can bring her an offering. You have to eat, sleep, and find shelter. You don't bring her an offering into a her. She just is. You know? Right. So when you're when when we have generations of people that are brought up to be. That necessity, which the the word has been traced back to angst, anxiety, to literally a ch- the, the, a, a choker that went around a slave. Oh wow! It, you know, it went back to being shackled in that particular way at the neck, being yoked. That's where the name comes from. So in New York, I used to notice this phenomenon of women looked at your shoes and other women's shoes to see where you existed in the food chain. Ah, right. Yeah. Cause it's very telling. And so, so that anxiety, which does not have to exist if we move towards an egalitarian landscape, right. Um, which is another form. Altruism is just as strong a- a- as, you know, the nihilism at the heart of the terror that comes from this anxiety that we're not going to get what we need to survive. And so we could have a culture of abundance where we don't are not gripped by that goddess in her totality and to become monotheistic in that way. We could have a society set up that way. But so many of these humiliated young men, you know, you hear about 4chan and you hear their connection to these shooting sprees and their humiliation and them constantly being taunted by being I mean, the other day I was somebody on a post that's called exit Dems. I when I pointed out when they put up Bernie Sanders had geography, I pointed a few facts about Bernie Sanders. And she even though, you know, I'm an older man with with a seven year old son and a wife, she called me an incel. <laughs> <laughs> that's how disconnected liberal consciousness is or even, you know, the Bernie bot mindset. So. But what if I was a younger man that did wasn't able to find my poetic sense and go to the community college after I'd had enough dead end jobs and it drank myself into self-destruction and found a theater group at the community college and one of the uh, one won a scholarship in those days where I could actually have my own apartment and majored in drama and journalism because a couple of t- a, t- a professor found a, a creative writing and a journalism professor found I had a talent to write. And I was able to, in college, support myself and then learn by ways of busking and writing to make a living. What What if I had never found that? Maybe I'd still be in my parents' basement. Right. You know, because I was confused and I didn't know what this, you know, what this, you know, what, what was at hand for me and what was offered or just be destroyed on some intuitive emotional level by it. And, you know, and so I found a way to 
ensconce down there with my computer and create an identity, which we, you know, I'm an internet writer right now because what's happened to print, right? I know. I used to talk to my late friend Joe Bajent about that, that where does a leftist writer actually publish now? Oh, you knew you, you knew know. Joe Bajent, huh? Oh uh, yeah, we um we he read my writing, I read his, and we got to be pretty close before his death. Oh, he was really one of my favorite writers before he died. Yeah, we used to go down and visit him in Winchester, and he'd come up whenever he'd stay with us. He'd stay with us in New York when he came up. Yeah, I miss his voice in these times. Yeah, and um, you know Joe destroyed himself. He couldn't reconcile that. I mean, Joe was had a number of addictions, and the smoking addiction eventually killed him. Right. And, you know, so but I understood we would spend up long hours. I remember showing a Miyazaki spirited away and trying to without overtly preaching to him that Miyazaki grasped that you can never get enough of what you truly don't want. You know, to paraphrase Eric Hoffer, as I did earlier, that Miyazaki's movie Spirited Away shows the house of the spirits that can possess us. And the way that the spirit have you, have you seen it by the way? I have not. No, I really want to. It's I, I on would my highly list. recommend the animated cartoon. It's brilliant. Well, you can't call it a cartoon. You can say it, you know, animated work of brilliance uh -huh. by the Japanese animator Miyazaki. Um, and um, it's um, and what one? Um, I guess my wife won't mind this, but as she and as she and Joe's wife were doing some ayahuasca in the other room that Joe had made up, we watched Spirited Away. Nice. And um, so it was and I talked to him about it, but it breaks my heart because, I mean, the man was so gifted, but he was so and, and we this is one thing we really bonded about was how he was so hurt of what capitalist culture did to his father. You know, his last book is about that subject, Rainbow Pie. And we had this I had the same experience with my father that how a, 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 an intelligent man with many gifts had been so broken so young by this essentially what was a hierarchy of bullies. And, you know, my father's sensitivity of not knowing what he was being half Native American ancestry, um, being stolen from his family, then attempting to adapt to a working class Jewish culture in Birmingham, where his mother, a widow, who was imposing in the Joan and attractive in the Joan Crawford sense, was trying to find a suitable mate and found a man that owned a couple of, of store uh, retail stores in Birmingham that was considered affluent and essentially rejected my father, sending him to military school, which sent him into the American military. And my father never recovering in his own way from these traumas. And Joe's father essentially, after they, they moved out, out of Appalachia and mo moved to Winchester having the same problems um, and the way that um, th these howling demons of shame play through you when you're with that, you know, when you're in that culture. And Joe found a remarkable style of expressing that later in his life. You know, before that, he had he had lived in Boulder. He had, um, you know, he had been ex ex exposed to, to Henry. He was a friend of Hunter S. Thompson, but was really laboring within, you know, pretty much mainstream journalism until he had a crack up, almost destroyed his marriage, went back to um, to Winchester, began at the at the early years of the Bush administration, um, writing about um, his people. And it came through with, with, with such clarity and humor and passion that he became a bit of a phenomenon. And. I don't know who I, I, I we were met when um, the writer John Stepling, the playwright, um, um, had liked both of our works. And he said uh, he, he gave we had an inner online three way discussion. And from that, Joe and I forged a friendship. And I, he's somebody who I deeply miss. Yes. You know, the, I still pick up my he, I have a Hawaiian ukulele he gave me oh, nice. when he found out I played the ukulele. Uh, it needs a little repairs now, so I'm playing my plastic pop art one. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but whenever I take out that ukulele, um, I kind of I shed a few tears as I play it for Joe. Um. <laughs> so we we've been talking for a little over two hours, and I think I want to uh, wow. wrap it up. I know, right? Yeah. So uh, and I, I want to wrap it up. So maybe just um, 
maybe we could end just by talking about how um, how to keep one's perspective over the course of the next uh, two months here until the election. And if what that and if your answer is just, you know, turn off the computer, I understand that. <laughs> <laughs> I do have to do that sometime. But, I, I, you know, I really can't. I don't think it's the place of writers to offer remedy. We have to find a way not to go around it, but to go through it. And mm. sometimes even an extremist. Um, you know, James Hillman, who I mentioned, has a book called We've Had 100 Years of Psychotherapy and the World is Getting Worse. And sometimes I think you have to find the part of yourself that can stay centered, but be off balance at the same time in, in the poetic sense. And I think we have to feel the extremists of this. But remember, there's the part we can go crazy and be sane at the same time. And we're you, did you understand what I mean by that, that we're just going to have to we're going to have to um, look into the abyss and we're, we're going to have to report back on. And the only thing we can do is find the, the means within ourselves to find a way to give an honest reportage and make it interesting. That's the only thing that, that we can do as writers and creative and activists, you know, they, 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 the, the, the activist wing of us have to go out there and we have to, the, the barricades have to illuminate the night. You know, that has to be done. And so um, this election is going to go badly no matter how who wins. Yes. You know, it's going to go badly that, that Biden's going to come in there at best to be. I don't think he has the political gifts to be a Trojan horse like Obama. And and, it, and so what I think will happen under a Biden administration was you're going to get a more gifted and more destructive demagogue to even Trump rise after that. And even and so the destructive demagogue that Trump is would would wreak havoc and you know we there are no tea leaves i can't look in any crystal ball about this i can just have an understanding of what the second law of thermodynamics and how it works and that systems that are both insular like uh, like u.s culture and its political class are they they veer into um, states of hypertrophy and and the result is a, a whole lot of suffering. And so, you know, during this period of time, I think all we can do is what people have done. I mean, I, you know, at my worst and when I'm tormented at night thinking about my son and thinking about the other children in this world, I think about my mother, my, my mother on that kinder transport where her father is in concentration camp. She witnessed him taking the Gestapo coming and. Um, and he made them wait while he took a bath <laughs> and him being marched out of the house by the Gestapo um, and her going on to, um, the you know, Blitzkrieg Britain and then coming to the United States because we distant family were the Wahlberg family when they, they, they allowed us to come to the States because of the strict stipulation that our peasant ass never darkens their door. And um, and so we that brought my family, my mother to the United States. My father, through what, what I talked about earlier, found his way to Birmingham. My mother's neighbor um, went to University of Georgia where my mother was working to pay her way through because her family didn't think girls should go to college. But she had a drive to put herself through the university. And we were lucky because she gave us the stable life of being a school teacher. With that, so she met my father at his at a party of his neighbor, his, his um, and that's how I was born through this catastrophe of history. So I look at my son, and I look at the other children, and I look at this unknowable landscape we're in, and I say that that in us, as you know, with these seeds that are going to keep growing, the wisdom the trees give you, even though so many of their ranks are being decimated. The, 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 the flora is going to be here. The, we are going to rise. And um, so that when you say, what can we do during this two months? It's a much longer 
it's going to be a much longer tale unfolding um, of both moments of joy and tragedy before us. But I think we have to embrace this is what we have and use it for the criteria of our work. What else are we given? You know, so I would say that, you know, we we can go crazy. I mean, I write poetry about it. I pick up a musical instrument. I go play with my kid. Sometimes, I, and I have to admit, I I want to. Cr- I go and close the door, and I turn on the water so my kid can't hear me weeping. I do that sometimes, and then I come out and I try to write about it. Um, so I think we can. We have to say you found your way to contribute, and by this this way of the ancestry coming through the seeds that we were talking, it goes all the way back to the Big Bang and how the nutrients were put in the soil, and we are made of those same things. You are doing your part. I think every time you pet a lonely cat, you know, <laughs> I think that probably makes you like they bring animals into into old folks' homes, and and you know that makes that helps them, and for sick people and autistic people, and you know people that are. I mean, think about the alienation of people that are afflicted with this mal- this malady that is growing with autism, and how being around animals helps them. Right. So I think I would tell you to go pet some kitties. <laughs> Voices for Nature and Peace is produced in the Gila River Valley, New Mexico, USA, on land that we acknowledge is illegally occupied Apache territory. The intro music is Zero G Yogi by Big Z, with narration by Kelly Moody of the Ground Shots podcast. This outro music is Trip A, also by Big Z. Commercial break narration by Nikki Hill. To become a financial supporter of this podcast and to gain access to members-only content, visit patreon.com slash colibri, K-O-L-L-I-B-R-I. For more information on Radio Free Sunroot programming, please visit radiofreesunroot.com. Thank you for listening. May you find joy in your own nature and peace.